Hey everybody, welcome to episode 93 of the Ask Staff Show, where we answer your Volkswagen and Audi questions. On this episode, we talk about anti-seize on spark plugs and why VW isn't using torque vectoring. James via Facebook says, Hey Paul, maybe you'll know. Should you use anti-seize when installing spark plugs in the Mark 7 GTI? Okay, so this question was asked on a Mark 7 Facebook group asking about spark plugs and anti-seize. Uh, and literally every time I shoot, we shoot any video that talks about installing or removing spark plugs on any vehicle, no matter what it is, inevitably we get a comment that says that either we should have used anti-seize or we didn't use anti-seize or why didn't we use anti-seize. Uh, and I want to clarify this. I have never in my life used anti-seize on a spark plug ever. Uh, it's not common practice in anywhere I've ever been, anywhere where anybody has done. And uh, I reached out to a few people just to verify. And I know uh, Charles, the home mechanic, actually jumped in on this. He said he's never used anti-seize. There's also an Audi tech who's also uh, a very active member in that one. He said he's never used anti-seize. And then I also reached out to a dealer friend of mine who's a tech at a VW dealer in Jersey, just to make sure that maybe because, you know, my perception is being down here with the weather, we don't get a lot of rust because of salt on the roads is not very prevalent. So maybe I was thinking, okay, maybe it's common practice there. And I just forgot because I was, it's been a long time since I've been in the industry in the Northeast. So he also uh, said the same thing. He doesn't use anti-seize on any spark plugs. Here's the one thing I think that which is, anti-seize was commonly used on spark plugs, I believe on older vehicles, especially uh, cars that used non-aluminum cylinder heads. And the reason why is because obviously if you have a non-aluminum cylinder head, it's gonna be subject to rust. Aluminum doesn't rust the same way those other uh, iron head would, heads would have or steel or any other material would have rusted. So that would be why maybe people talk about using anti-seize as if it's a common practice because they read stuff uh, that is literature that was used in the past and that's why. The only time I've ever known of uh, where I, I suspect you would ever have an issue with this would be if either the head maybe was warped from being overheated that maybe have a problem with the spark plug coming out or if it was over tightened and it potentially damaged the threads when they were installing the spark plug, obviously cross-threaded spark plugs are another thing. So, you know, people who go crazy uh, and don't make sure they have clean threads before they actually run something down. That's another way you could have it. Uh, it's definitely something that happens over time. And, and I've heard of people breaking off spark plugs in cylinder heads. That's not uh, the most rare thing ever. It's not common by any means, trust me. Uh, but it, I've heard of it happening. The one thing I always see people say is, you know, warm up a, a, an engine before you try to remove the plugs, make sure it's not stone cold. That will also help prevent issues like uh, things breaking off in the head. So a good question. And again, we get it a lot, but in my opinion, anti-seize is not something that's required as long as everything is being torqued properly, the threads are clean, um, and all of those other factors that I've talked about are not a factor on that vehicle. Bruce Barlow via email says, I recently ordered a Unitronic Stage 1 Plus tune in an R600 intake. The tune is great, makes impressive power, as the title of the email indicates. I'm already thinking about upgrading the clutch. I'm 38 and drive the car like a grandpa most of the time, but I do play occasionally. I've already noticed that from a roll in second or third, I give it the beans and don't roll into the throttle gently, I'm getting clutch slippage. My question is this, if the most power I realistically ever plan to get out of the car is less than 350 horsepower, with a stage 2 tune and downpipe down the road, what clutch would you recommend? I see that the South Bend has two, they're about $100 apart, and provide a 65 foot-pound rating difference. Is it worth to spend slightly more to get the stouter part? Okay, so Bruce, first of all, thank you so much for the purchases. I appreciate it very much, and I'm stoked that you're happy with the software and the intake. Uh, good question around clutches. This is something that we've touched on a little bit of stuff about clutches, but I'm not sure really in this way. Um, yes, if you're looking to go with upgrading a clutch, obviously because you're already having slippage, I would recommend upgrading that sooner than later because you don't want to end up with a situation where you end up leaving yourself stranded if you have an aggressive driving situation and slips the clutch and smokes it. Um, upgrading clutch, is it which one is worth it and which one should you go with? So my opinion is always go with whatever meets the criteria of what you're looking for. And South Bend, as a general rule, I would say is they make great products and as a general rule, they're going to rate their clutches 
I would say on a conservative basis, they've been around a long time. They've been in the clutch game a long time. And so they want to make sure that whatever their product is meets the requirements of actually what they're saying it does. So when I, when they say, for example, you're talking about the stage two daily, which is a 400 pound foot of torque rating. Uh, they say that's the up to 400 pound foot of torque. I think that that would be a better choice for you than the endurance, which has a little bit of a higher rating again, 65 foot pounds. Um, increase in rating but what i think for you as a person who's just looking for a daily driver something that's going to hold and meet the the demands you have but still probably has kind of the comfort factor or at least as much as possible that you're not going to sacrifice that that what that's why i would choose the stage two daily because whenever you go up in increments on any clutch you're going to start to compromise a little bit of the drivability now i think most of those clutches are not going to be terrible until you until you get to a puck clutch. You're not really going to have a terrible, not positive experience when it comes to a big gap between the factory setup and, and that one. But for an average person, I think that going that way is the best choice because it's it re- meets your requirements. And since you're not going to get up past that range, there's no need to A, spend the additional money or B, have the downsides of what getting that extra clamping force requires even if it is a marginal uh, amount so for some people they would probably have the opinion that they would have rather overbuy than under which that depends on your driving style and i think for you based on my gut feeling of who you are as a person and a driver that's going to be your best bet if you were somebody who drove very aggressively and beat the death out of your car then i would probably overbuy on a clutch so hopefully that shares some insight and again thank you so much for the purchase i really appreciate it Joe Goodman via email says, I enjoy your answers on YouTube. If you feel others would be interested, maybe you can answer this for me. Why does VW not give the Golf R some torque vectoring capability like many of the Audi models have? All right, Joe. So yes, I agree with you. There are probably other people who are interested in this particular topic. Let me, before we talk about that, let's go into a little bit of detail about what torque vectoring is. So essentially, uh, most people are probably familiar with uh, what a open differential versus a limited slip differential. Basically the open differential, when you have all the power, when one wheel starts to slip, the path of least resistance is what the power will follow. So when you break one wheel loose, all the power will then end up forced at the wheel that is has no longer has traction, which is what people call one wheel peel or a peg leg, which basically means when you're doing a burnout, only one tire is spinning. Uh, limited slip differentials have the ability to have both of the wheels driving and are better for for performance. What he's referring to is torque vectoring, which is something that's found on Audi models. And they have a differential that has the ability to control each individual axle. Um, so that looks a lot like Haldex, but almost for just in the rear differential for left to right, uh, torque vectoring, uh, to control left to right power, as opposed to Haldex controls front to rear. So if you're not familiar with what Haldex looks like, I'll link to a video that I shot explaining Haldex here, where you can understand a a broad overview of how Haldex works, which is what you would find on a Mark 7 Golf R. So essentially what what it would look like if you had a Mark 7 Golf R that had torque vectoring, if you understand how Haldex works, you have your transmission up front, you would have your drive shaft that goes to the back, you would have a Haldex coupler that goes between the drive shaft and the rear differential. And then if you had uh, a vectoring differential in that rear differential, you would then have another system that allowed it to control the power to the left and right rear wheel. You get that's for optimum performance. It also, it allows the vehicle to control traction much better. Uh, that it's a great system, obviously performance. I think the RS4 was the first vehicle to have that set up. And then uh, the B8 S4 also was one of the first mainstream Audis to have that. Um, So why would VWs not have that? I mean, frankly, purely cost. There's no other reason other than cost. Adding that is is very much a luxury for performance and not a necessity, which is why they wouldn't put it in the Golf R. It's not in the S3, which is a more more expensive car than the Golf R. Uh, which is why you know you're not going to find it in that. Although I did hear see some mention of it as being an option on all Quattro Audis, so I don't know if some S3s have that available. But to my knowledge, it's not an S3 option. So if it is, feel free somebody leave in the comments below. 
that, that is something on current S3s, but as far as I know, that's not the case. Um, but yeah, it really boils down to cost. Adding all wheel drive in general is an expensive proposition, but then adding a differential that has that ability, which is really a high end option. I mean, you're talking about S4s are $60,000, 70000 cars. That's kind of the entry level cars that would be found as a general rule with that type of differential. Whereas a Golf R, while it is an expensive car uh, in the VW world, when you get into the Audi world, it's not as expensive as those other models. So it really boils down to cost. My, my guess is if they added an option like that, it would, it would be a couple thousand dollar option, maybe, maybe even more because of the scarcity of people who would actually be willing to spend the money on a differential like that uh, versus the amount that they would sell, you know, uh, just required to manufacture to make it uh, logistically sensible. So hopefully that explains and I'm sure that probably doesn't make you feel great because you're, you don't get the differential you want, but uh, unfortunately oftentimes when you have those type of items like that, it's not gonna be something you're gonna find on most vehicles. And my guess is that probably as time goes on, you may find more and more VW models that get it. The Golf R would almost certainly be one of the first, but uh, that's probably a little ways out before it will have torque vectoring. As every manufacturer kind of steps up their game, it's kind of always a game of catch up and everybody wants to one up each other to make a better features on their cars. So it, if it becomes normal, I would expect to see it in the Golf R or maybe them be the leader of it. But I would say maybe Mark 8 would be the first vehicle that I would expect to have something like that. Diego via YouTube says, to measure the fuel pressure to check if fuel pump is good on a 2.0T FSI is in the HPFP gauge? So this question was asked on one of our high pressure fuel pump videos. I can't recall if it was FSI or TSI, uh, but essentially he's asking how to go about diagnosing high pressure fuel pumps or a low pressure fuel pump being bad. Uh, there's a multitude of ways you can do it. Uh, you can use either something, a scan tool like OBD11 or RAGCOM to do it. Uh, and I'll show you, take a look here on this screen. And I show this as a demonstration on a Mark 7. And what you would do is go into the adaptation channel for reading uh, high and low pressure fuel values. And as you can see, you see it raise and lower as you rev it uh, through the RPMs. This would also be for older models, just for, for context, uh, newer models that we've shown, actually you go and have the ability to search by channel name. Um, and on older models, you actually have to know the adaptation channel number. So uh, for m older models, if you don't, if we go into the live data section and all you see is a number value you have to enter, 103 would be uh, low pressure and I believe it's 240 uh, for high pressure, which would give you the data block to measure that group of things. Uh, and you can measure the, the uh, pressure coming out. Again, there's not, a, there's not a sensor coming out of the fuel pump, so it's measuring fuel pressure in its own designated place. For later models, TSI engines actually don't have a low pressure fuel sensor. FSIs have a low and a high pressure fuel pressure sensor. They only have one sensor, so you wouldn't actually have a low pressure sensor. So. What most likely you're trying to do is determine if you either have an in-tank in -tank pump that's bad or a fuel pump module that's bad. Uh, that's going to be a tough thing to do with a scan tool because you're probably going to see the same result coming from a bad fuel pump module or uh, possibly the fuel pump itself. The only variation you could do is try to run it through the vehicle. Uh, this is something that you could do. It's an option. Start the, start the engine and see if you have fuel coming out of the fuel pump itself or maybe pull off one of the fuel lines. Again, this is super important. Make sure it's a low pressure line because high pressure lines are un under extremely high pressure. So make sure it's not one of the mechanical lines that actually um, is coming out of the fuel pump at that high pressure going into the fuel rail. Um, see if you have fuel coming out of there. If you do, then you know that that fuel pump is likely good. There, you could have a volume issue. Uh, that could be a fuel pump issue, but that would be a determining factor there. If you have no fuel coming out, you could, you could in theory remove remove the pump module, jump it to power the fuel pump mo the fuel pump itself, and see if you get fuel that would help you to eliminate the module from the system and determine if the fuel pump itself is bad, um, and then you would be able to isolate one or the other. And that's really what it comes down to with diagnosing stuff is you can use a scan tool to uh, find that part of the issue, and then use 
actual testing of actual parts to use that as a combination for diagnosing a problem like that. So uh, thank you for the question and hopefully it helps you diagnose your fuel pump issue. Thanks so much for watching episode 93 of the Ask That Show where we answer your Volkswagen and Audi questions. If you have any questions or comments about the questions answered in this show, be sure to leave them in the comments below. If you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more like it.